Knight vlog on John Wick 2, which I recently, which I just more or less got out of seeing in theaters. I'm not doing the in the car and night screening thing because I'm not quite equipped with my phone for doing that. I might give it a shot at some point, but anywho, just got out of seeing John Wick Chapter 2. I previously recruit, reviewed John Wick Chapter 1. Or the original John Wick, effectively chapter one. Link will be in the show notes, and I'll try to stick that the link to that in the post credit stinger. Um, with the uh, or the post world thing. So, if you're unfamiliar with John Wick, you're going to want to see the movie before first movie before you see this film. But actually, it builds, it, it introduces you to the world in about the same way. Maybe a little more, but it's worth seeing the first film because it introduces a lot of information that comes up here. Short version is John Wick in the first film is a former assassin who did a, several major jobs, including a seemingly impossible hit for the Russian mob. And doing this hit, he earned the thing that very few assassins and the thing in all organized crime film everyone tries to do, but they can't. He retired. He was out. He was done. And the thing he did was so impossible, and the feats he performed before, the hits he performed before, were so spectacular, he got the nickname of the mob of Baba Yaga, the Bogeyman. And in the first film, Wick had retired, he had got married, like, uh, and his wife died of cancer. And shortly after his wife's death, she left him a dog, someone, something to help fill the hole in his life and something with him so he didn't go back to the life that he had before. And then <clears throat> some jackass, the son of a local Russian mobster who envied John Wick's car, this person played by this uh, Alfie Woodward, the same guy who played um, Theon Greyjoy on Game of Thrones. Uh, so I thought we'd break into John Wick's house, home invasion robbery, steal his car, and in the course of this, they also kill John Wick's dog. And that sets off a bloody path of vengeance on John Wick's part. This film picks up not long after the events of John of the first film. Um, John Wick as part of the attempts to kind of rebuild his life and this sort of stuff has adopted a new dog. A pit bull who if I set up in the first film, not only set up if if you're paying attention to the uh signage <clears throat> is slated for her uh being put to sleep because it's a pit bull that nobody wanted to adopt. And Wick is retrieving his car from another group of uh, Russian mobsters. And he gets his car back. Or smacks it up really good in the process, but he gets his car back. And after he goes home, and that evening he gets a visit from a mobster, a member of the Komora. Or, you know, more, if you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with, with organized crime groups outside of the usual Russian mob, mafia, yakuza, that whole thing. The Camorra is the other Italian mob. They make the Sicilian mafia look cheerful and amiable by comparison. And as part of the tasks needed to perform this impossible hit that allowed John to get out, he did a marker with the head uh, with, with 
the basically the head of the uh, Kamora, the son of the head of the Kamora. Um, and when the head of the Kamora passed away, he bet- he bequeathed his seat at the big table. A council of, I believe they say twelve syndicates. He bequeathed the seat to not his son, but his daughter. His son doesn't like this, and so he has the mindset of, well, cash in my marker, and I want to have John Wick kill my sister. And then I'll be uh, able to sit at the big table and play with the big boys. Big boys and girls. Wicks out, though. He's retired. The only reason he was active again was his taking revenge. And, but markers in the syndicate, and the syndicate in, in this world, the underworld, are not so easily set aside, and things are set in motion. Wick ends up doing the hit, and then in grand assassin movie traditions, he is then screwed by his employer. And so Wick is now on the run. So, that's it. That's basically the plot of the film. And he said, hey, wait a minute, Assassin takes on one last job. And after completing the job is screwed by his employer, just want to pay him. That sounds all like the plot of the killer. Then we start getting into, okay, that's kind of what this film is. This film is a lot of a love letter for the heroic bloodshed genre. The gun-fu films of Ringo Lamb, John Woo, uh, Johnny Toe, that sort of thing. In fact, we have, there's a direct oma- the call-out hit to A Better Tomorrow. There's a scene where John Wick is preparing his exit route for an assassination, for the assassination attempt. He starts depositing guns along the route. If they're not, in, which is a reference to a scene from A Better Tomorrow, the only way it could be more overt would be if the guns were directly placed underneath flower pots. That's how direct we're getting here. In or underneath or in or what have you around flower pots. And there's other references there. There's a sequence which pays homage to um, well, the most iconic of Bruce Lee's films, Enter the Dragon. Or the most iconic of Bruce Lee's completed films, Enter the Dragon. That was mean Game of Death is the fight of the cream of Dolce Bar, but that film was never actually completed. That's not the matter. And the film also gets further into the world of the world that John Wick and the assassins live in. And it does it in a way which I think works. And it's as a tabletop role player that I enjoy. Which is Characters know things when they need to know things, and they don't need to have things blow by blow explained out to them. They are competent in the world in which they exist. And occasionally there are reminders, but those reminders are pretty straightforward, and it's when people are going to make mistakes that they would logically make under the circumstances. For example, in the first film, they're, in, they're introduced to the rules of the Continental, which is the hotel that John Wick stays at in that film, and in this film as well. And the like the rules of the continent are all the particular the most sacred and viable rule about rule is no doing business, killing people on the grounds of the continental. That sort of thing. And <clears throat> so we go a bit more into that here because there's other little bits we in the first film we see this economy, this underground economy focused around these gold coins. We see a bit more of that in terms of where the where, where the money goes, and a little bit of where the money comes from. We get ideas of the groups involved in this. And again, I play tabletop role-playing games. I backed the Feng Shui 2 Kickstarter, and I own a copy of that game. 
which, if you remember my um, tabletop role playing games or video game fans video two, that I, I get into that there. There, the underground world there, the one that's more overtly supernatural, this one here. If you're dealing with the world of darkness and the various chunks of that for Vampire of the Masquerade, Mage of the Ascension, that sort of thing, a little less a werewolf. The whole idea of these underground societies with their own rules and their own sort of code of ethics and secrecy and that sort of thing that are utterly inviolate, that are absolutely that absolutely connect to the world of John Wick. So all that's built up more here, but without getting too in your face with it, without getting super info dumpy in it with it. This could have gotten into oh when he's introducing the big table and who's sitting at the big table could have had a big scene info dumping here's all twelve major organized crime organizations sitting at the big table you have the triads you have the Yakuza you have the African diamond smugglers all this that and the other thing and now instead it's we see a selection of people. Some of them are wearing kind of ethnic garb. We, there is a person there we see wearing the the not quite stereotypical Arab chic attire, but what you think of when you think about to say Arab chic, kind of what you think when you see that, and a few other similar groups, and you can kind of put things together of okay, Arab oil cartels. So they have their fingers in every pie. They have, we have the Yakuza, we can assume the Yakuza, the Mafia, we know the Kamora is part of this, we know the Russian mob's part of this, and that sort of thing. We don't know who is sitting at the table for these various groups, but there are people sitting at the table from these various groups. And we can make guesses in the back of our mind, but we're not getting any big, in-your-face, definite, info-dumpy answers on everything. And so the world... Is built up nicely. The first film focused entirely in New York City. Um, John Wick lived in across New Jersey. The Continental is somewhere in New York. We go a few other places. Not really any landmarks here. We go a few more landmarks, but we also go overseas. We go to Italy, including with Italy getting a great cameo appearance by Franco Nero, who was in. Tons of spaghetti westerns and Italian exploitation films. He was in, among other things, Enter the Ninja. So if you want to see Franco Nero in a ninja outfit with a mask, but still keeping his classic mustache, because really, are you going to be the person to tell Franco Nero to shave his mustache? There's that there. So... That is really nice. It's nice seeing a bigger chunk of the world. And the action scenes we get in Italy are also wonderfully done. We have great chase scenes. We have car chase, foot chase. When the order comes in, when uh, the head, the, the when Wick is screwed over on his contract, we get a great little sort of montage of various colorful assassins coming after Wick. It's let it, it reminds me a bit of in the second season of Black Lagoon. There's the Greenback Jade, Greenback Jane arc, where like all of the colorful assassins in Ranapur are coming out after being back Jane because of all the money that's on the table in terms of if you bring her in. And it's a little bit of that. It's not quite so spectacular because to a certain extent with uh, Black Lagoon, we started getting into the Warriors territory. Not quite Baseball Furies, but close. We have a little more sedate here. There's a there's like a busker who's getting get too much players. There's a busker who's an assassin. There's a guy who's basically kind of sumo wrestler who's an assassin. And various 
other groups, which are really cool. And it's a really well done sequence and has a great sense of tension. And the film does a good job of handling the whole thing of, well, John Wick we set up as this unstoppable juggernaut of destruction. He's like the Terminator. He won't stop you until you're dead in the first film. And how do you escalate that without stripping him of some of his mystique and some of the badassery we've seen before? And the answer to that is the action scenes in the first film, but this one as well, is you get the impression that Wick Wick is getting older. He's slowing down some. And the fight scenes, the action scenes, they take their toll. And you set these things up well, like he Wick gets a suit of um this is one of the clips that's on the official John Wick YouTube channel for the movie, where he gets this suit with a ballistic liner. And the tailor's like, hey, this will stop bullets. This will stop pretty much any bullet. But it will hurt. But it will hurt. And so you see Wick walking along after this and getting shot a bunch of times. And he's limping and he's, um, he's wincing and flinching and that sort of thing because he's gotten the crap beat out of him. He'll, it, he's a Bruce Willis type badass, but with the Terminator's precision. The Terminator, shrugs off everything. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone, they shrug off anything. You stab them in the arm, they just grin and yank the knife out and stab you with it. Whereas a Bruce Willis character like John McClane, you stab them in the knife in the arm, they sell that for a very long time in the movie. And the John Wick, he's kind of in the middle. You stab him in the, you try and you stab him in the leg with a knife Assuming you don't hit a major artery, he'll yank the knife out, stab you with it, then bandage up the wound, and limp for hours. And sell the limp. Because it's an injury and it hurts. And it works. It also helps this film, but this film gives us basically two heavies who are the near equals of John Wick. Um, one played by Common, another played by Ruby Rose. Uh, Ruby Rose has been in some of the Fast and Furious movies, which I, the later ones, which I haven't seen yet, I know, bad me. But, I enjoyed her performance in this. She plays a deaf assassin, or well, bodyguard, for the, anta the antagonist, and she has really good chemistry with John Wick. She has a really good physical performance with the role. And particularly seeing she has, well, deaf, she, her character has no lines. She, and, she instead has to convey her sense of character through how she uses sign language. And, that works really well. There's the great bit where, Winwick gets screwed. And, she, uh, and he sees her and he realizes what's about to happen. It's, dumb, it's not stupid. As, so, loose ends to tie, so how many loose ends to tie up? And her response is just one. And the sign language for one is not the middle finger, but that's the finger that comes up. It works really well. The film also is perfectly willing to have characters using languages other than English. The subtitles to the audience's benefit, but it makes the subtitles as much a part of the storytelling as the dialogue itself through what words it puts particular focus on in the graphics, the color, through typeface, through bold or italics of the font, and that sort of thing. It's something that Nightwatch did, a Russian film um, adapting an urban fantasy novel, and I really enjoyed it in that film. It's one of the first reviews I ever wrote for publication anywhere. Uh, for the Clackamas print, I don't believe it's available online. I'll see if it is. If it is, I'll definitely put it in the show notes. Um, but it's something they did in the first film, and I definitely enjoyed it when they did it here in this film. So, without getting any further in this, I definitely recommend checking out John Wick Chapter 2. It is a wonderfully done piece of cinema. It's excellently shot action scenes. It continues with the trait that the first John Wick film did, which is letting the action scenes speak for, speak for themselves, 
not getting into shaky cam, not getting into too tight camera angles that conceal the action and conceal the work that the stunt performers have done and the actors have done into preparing these fight scenes. It lets the, the actors and the staging of the scenes speak to the chaos of the fight scene and also in the process the professionalism and skill of the characters involved and thus in turn the actors and stunt performers involved. And again, I don't know how much stunt work was, um, in the fight scenes was done by Ruby Rose, how, or as far as how much she did herself, and how much was done by, uh, the stunt woman, same thing with Common, but they do excellent jobs in, in their fight scenes, and I want to see the Fast and the Furious films that, that Ruby Rose is in now, because of seeing her performance here and seeing what she brings to the screen in that in those films. I believe she's also in the new Triple X movie. Same sort of thing there as well. So that if you have seen John Wick 2, I ask please give no further spoilers than what I have given in this video if you post your thoughts in the comments. But I do want to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.